Good morning. <laughs> Technical issues. It's all right. <clears throat> For those of you who don't know me, you're new here. My name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. For those of you who've known me for a long time, know that I started out in the worship ministry, and um, that can be rough. <laughs> It'll make you panic. <laughs> What's wrong? <laughs> I really hated relying on technology, but they do a really good job. Let's hear it for them, our worship leaders here. It's a tough job. People have asked me which one's harder, preaching or leading worship. The preparation for preaching is much harder. In the moment, leading worship is much harder. You guys don't have the words up on the screens for me, so you don't know when I mess up. <laughs> Very little tech to rely on. Not too much that can go wrong, except when I have to clear my throat excessively. I'm excited about the fourth part now of our Jesus League series. We've done Matthew, Mark, Luke, now it is John. This is the last of the four gospels set in the New Testament section of our Bibles. We're looking at the writers of the New Testament, the witnesses to Jesus. So we've discussed what that means. I think we should jump right in. John, who was John? John was an apostle. He was one of the original followers of Jesus. And Mark's gospel account, he's one of the first it's Simon Peter, then Andrew, then James and John. Immediately afterwards, they follow him. They were fishermen. The Zebedee brothers were their names, James and John. He's part of what some might consider Jesus' inner circle of disciples. Sometimes Jesus would go off and do things apart from people, semi-privately, and he would take Peter, James, and John with him. So we see this, one of these occasions, in Mark 9, verse 2. Six days later... Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them alone up a high mountain privately. And he was transfigured before them. So without the context here, it may be hard to understand. This is when he's transformed. He's glowing radiantly. He has Elijah and Moses with him. They actually get kind of freaked out by it. But it's an amazing window into this kind of secret event. Look what he says here, Mark 9.9. 9. As they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead, after he was resurrected. So John is a part of that trusted inner circle, so to speak. What did John write? John, the Gospel of John. We have letters later toward the end of our Bible, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, then he didn't write that, then Revelation. So the Gospel of John, as I said, it's the fourth of the Gospel accounts. It is not what people consider a synoptic Gospel. So just picture it this way to make things easy. You have Matthew, Mark, and Luke in circulation. Okay, so those are going around, floating around there. Then years later, John writes his Gospel account and adds some extra details that aren't in the other accounts. Also, heresies are starting to creep in, like Jesus wasn't God. So John solves that problem right out the gate. John 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning was the Word, Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was fully God. The Word was with God in the beginning. All things were created by him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. Now, this is normally where I would hang for a while on the deity of Christ, super important really the major theme of John's gospel account. But we just recently went over this in pretty great detail in our Philippians series not too long ago. So I want to encourage you, if you haven't already, to download our app. You can watch previous sermons there, Philippians part two. Also, you'll see sermon notes, and you can click right on a direct link right to those sermon notes for Philippians 2. Revelation, those of you who know me, <laughs> They're laughing already. About Revelation, <clears throat> there is much, much required to understand Revelation properly, especially the beginning of your Bible. You got to read that. Remember the warnings that I was talking about last week, about false teachers in the Bible. It's a major theme in a lot of Paul's letters. He's warning about false teachers. There's a lot of them out there. The same is true today. And there are a lot of false teachings on 
revelation. So I like to think of it this way. False teaching is like fast food. Just because it's popular doesn't mean it's good for you. It's easy to swallow, but it's not good for you. Just because something's on the TV or the radio or someone has a YouTube channel <laughs> doesn't mean it's true, right? We know this about the news. Nowadays, actually, if it's on TV, it's probably not true. That's a better way to kind of look at things today, right? So I want to point you to some resources. I don't want to just leave you hanging on this. All right, so remember what I said about culture and history being really, really important. I made that joke about someone 2,000 years from now reading my emails today. You'd have to know a lot about the culture today to understand what I was talking about. We made some jokes there. won't repeat them. So I want to recommend this resource. He's a guy who knows a whole lot about the history and culture. His name is Dr. Craig Keener. Again, that link is in the app. On the sermon notes today, you can click on it, and it'll take you directly to his website with a whole bunch of teachings on Revelation that are sound. Be forewarned. I shared this with Dr. Dane, and when I did, not just Revelation, but Craig Keener's books, he said it felt like he was trying to sip from a fire hydrant. <laughs> I thought that was a good and correct <laughs> illustration, all right? So this guy, he has a four-volume set, a four-book set just on the book of Acts. <laughs> so it's crazy what he knows. He knows a lot of details. Really, really brilliant guy. So let's move on <clears throat> to the character of John. So he's unique. He's really unique because we get to see him go from a boy to a man, to a mature man, within his own writings. A while back, I tried to describe who the disciples were, how you should imagine them. You should imagine them as teenagers, all but maybe Peter. We know that from Matthew 17. There was a temple tax that he and Jesus had to pay. Right, so we know historically that unless you were 20, 21 years old, you didn't have to pay that. So when you imagine all the disciples, you can imagine them like Jesus is a 30-ish-year-old guy, then Peter maybe in his early 20s, and then the rest of them are all like 13 to 19 years old. All right, so in today's world, they're like kids. You know, we would say, oh, they're kids. Not then. All right, you'd be a man in the Jewish culture at 13 years old. So you got to kind of think of them that way. We get a window into John's personality just by the nickname Jesus gives him and his brother. Mark 3, verse 17. To James and his brother John the sons of Zebedee, he gave them the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. Why do you suppose that is? Well, <laughs> we see an account of them wanting to call down fire from heaven on the Samaritans. So if you do not, you're not familiar with this, they're all Jews, right? they're Jewish people. And the Jews don't like the Samaritans because the Samaritans are seen as half-breeds. They've mixed with other people. And the Samaritans don't like the Jews. <laughs> so you'll see here they're not going to be accommodating. Luke 9, starting at verse 52, Jesus sent messengers on ahead of him. As they went along, they entered a Samaritan village to make things ready in advance for him. But the villagers refused to welcome him because he was determined to go to Jerusalem. Now when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. We see also that James and John can be kind of pushy. Mark 10, starting at verse 35, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Sounds like some popular theology. He said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, permit one of us to sit at your right hand and the other to sit at your left in your glory. So picture him on the throne and there right at the right and left. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism I experience? They said to him, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and you will be baptized with the baptism I experience. But to sit at my right or left is not mine to give. It is for those whom it has been prepared. Now, when the other ten heard this, they became angry with James and John. But we see through his later letters 
that he goes from kind of like this hot-headed kid to a mature man. Look at 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. 2 John 1.4, I rejoice greatly because I have found some of your children living according to the truth, just as the Father commanded us. 3 John 1.4, I have no greater joy than this, to hear that my children are living according to the truth. So we get this picture, right, in the later letters of John as kind of like this older man writing to his children. He addresses other people as well, fathers and things like that, but we get this picture of him. He speaks of walking in light, truth, and love. So when he was young, he was running around everywhere. Remember, I told that joke about the race. Anyone who studied the Gospel of John knows that I always point this out because I think it's funny. Mary Magdalene tells them about the empty tomb, and here's what happens. John 20, verse 3, Then Peter and the other disciple, John, set out to go to the tomb. The two of them were running together, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and reached the tomb first. I think it's funny that he has to say that he beat Peter in a race, right? (laughs) But as he gets older, he's minding his steps more carefully. You know, when you're a kid, I watch the kids run around all the time. They're always running around somewhere, right? They're like, ah, and they just scream and run around. And they're like, why are you running? They're like, because I just discovered it. You know what I mean? Running is fun. You know, and they just, they they run around. They figure out that they can go really fast. Think about it. If you were crawling around for whatever, nine months or however long it is, you'd be excited about running around too. But what do we tell them as we get older? Slow down, right? You're going to get hurt. Stop. Don't run. Slow down. They do this and then they do it again. As soon as you're not looking, they can't help it. And they do that with their hands, too. I don't know. I think it's a balance thing. But, <laughs> but we always tell them, slow down, right? And there's wisdom in that. There's wisdom in that, right? We're not trying to ruin their fun all the time, <laughs> right? You know, you're going to get hurt. If I started running around the stage, all oh, you'd be like, oh, come on, old man, slow down. You're going to get hurt, right? So we do the same thing. You're going to get hurt if you go fast everywhere, right? What if you're driving like 80 miles an hour? Over? You're going to get into an accident. So this is the idea. Running around everywhere can get you into trouble. It can get you hurt. I don't want to create any absolutes for those of you who are runners or you like to jog. That's just fine. It's not what I'm saying. All right? I'm making a point about maturity. As we mature, we should take our time. Think things through, right? Don't run before you can walk. No absolute. So there's wisdom in that. It's prudent behavior. So let's take a look at some wisdom. Proverbs 6, starting at verse 16. There are six things that the Lord hates, even seven things that are an abomination to him. Haughty or prideful eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift to run to evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who spreads discord among family members. My child, guard the commands of your father and do not forsake the instruction of your mother. Feet that run toward evil. We are called to walk in integrity. Look at Psalm 101, starting at verse 1. I will sing about loyalty and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praises. I will walk in the way of integrity. When will you come to me? I will conduct my business with integrity in the midst of my palace. So this ties that loyalty that we spoke of last week to walking in integrity. We have to walk the walk. So what I want to do now is I just want to go through some of the scriptures here, some of John's walking statements. Just read these scriptures to you, let them kind of absorb in, and let it take us to our application. All right, so walking in the light. Let's start there. 1 John 1, 5. Now this is the gospel message we have heard from him and announced to you. God is light, and in him... There is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet keep on walking in the darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Let's look at the beginning of John's gospel again. We'll pick up where we left off. John 1, 4. In him, Jesus, was life. 
and the life was the light of mankind, and the light shines on in the darkness, but the darkness has not mastered it. This is one of the seven I am statements in John's gospel account. John 8, 12, then Jesus spoke out again, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. We are to walk in the light, not participating in the deeds of darkness. Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. We'll talk about Paul another week. But Ephesians 5, starting at verse 6, says this, Let nobody deceive you with empty words, for because of these things God's wrath comes on the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were at one time darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For the things they do in secret are shameful even to mention. But all things exposed by the light are made evident. For everything made evident is light. And for this reason it says, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Walking in the truth. 2 John 1.4 I rejoice greatly because I have found some of your children living according to the truth, just as the Father commanded us. This is another one of the I am statements in John's gospel account. John 14, 6, Jesus replied, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And finally, walking in love. 2 John 1, 6. Now this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning. Thus, you should walk in it. This is the identifying characteristic of a Christian. John 13, 34, Jesus says, I give you a new commandment to love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. Everyone will know by this that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. How will they know us? By our love. Not by our Bibles. <laughs> Not by the Jesus fish on the back of the car. We'll talk about the problem with that in a minute. Not by the cross that we wear around our neck. By our love. By loving people. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Are we walking in the light, in truth, and in love? Does what we do match what we are saying? Would someone recognize us as Christians by our behavior alone? What we do says more about what we believe than anything we could possibly say. Would people know that we're Christians by our driving? Think so? <laughs> when we cut somebody off and then we get in front of them and they see the Jesus fish. I read this article <clears throat> about Christian conventions years ago. And so like, you know, whatever it is, a worship conference, a convention, you know, they have them at Disney. I like to go to Disney. So they have one every year at the Contemporary Resort, right? And the people flood in there and I can't get a room. <laughs> so Christian conventions, right? And they interviewed a manager of a hotel about these conventions, basically asking like, what happens when Christians flood a hotel? Oh, I said, easy. One thing significantly increases. Subscriptions to the porn channels. True story. Tipping. Do people know that we're Christians by how we exercise generosity in all circumstances? I've heard Christians say, the waiter doesn't deserve a good tip. I think to myself, do we deserve God's grace? You think that that waiter is doing a bad job? Frame it this way. I want you all just to think about this. Don't answer this question. Next couple of questions, don't answer it. Just think. Be honest with yourself. On a scale of 1 to 10, 
How well, what good of a job on that scale did the waiter or waitress do the last time you ate out? So think about the last time you ate out and then come up with a number, a scale of one to 10. How good of a job did the waiter or waitress do? All right, keep it to yourself. Now with that in mind, on a scale of one to 10, how well, well, let's put it this way, how closely are you following Jesus' commandments in the Word of God? Don't answer, but be honest. What the Bible says, on a scale of 1 to 10, how well are you following Jesus' commands? Are we following Jesus' instructions better or worse than that waiter followed ours? I'll answer first. Worse. Worse. Look, you don't know what that person's going through, right? Maybe they needed love better than a bad tip. We all mess up, all of us. And as Christians, that's how we have to frame things, realizing just how much grace has been poured over us all the time. And that condition, that mindset, will compel us to love others better. Think about it that way. I'm not doing so great all the time that when I look at someone else, they judge them a little bit less, you know? Thank you for the grace. We need Jesus. Romans 3.23, all of us, we've all sinned and fallen short. That is the need for Jesus Christ. We require grace. But, Here's the thing. We're going to turn a little. We should not be intentionally sinning. You have to go out of your way to order the porn channel. You have to go out of your way to leave the bad tip. The road rage, I don't know. Maybe I'll let you off the hook on that one. I don't know if that's like an involuntary action. Not sure about that. But let's frame out a different scenario. Let's say someone cheats on their spouse. It happens. You have to go out of your way to do that. But that is an abuse of grace. We'll we'll get there in a second. Just hang with me. An abuser of grace is not someone who is of God. Look at what John says. 3 John 1.11. Dear friend, do not imitate what is bad, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does what is bad has not seen God. So hang on. An abuser of grace is someone like this not an accident. They cheat, right? Maybe they cheat on their spouse, but the spouse is really forgiving. And they say, you know what? You're forgiven. Just don't do it again. And they go, wait a minute. That was kind of cool. I got away with it. There are no consequences. And then they do it again (laughs) and again and again and again and again. This is an abuser of grace. The question arises, does that person really love their spouse? Clearly, No. This is how John frames it. 1 John 4.20 If anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his fellow Christian, he is a liar. Because the one who does not love his fellow Christian, whom he's seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And the commandment we have from him is this, that the one who loves God should love his fellow Christian too. And I would extend that, your enemy too. That's scriptural. Verse 20 is kind of like an if-it-walks-like-a-duck statement. This is the solution to the confusion that arises. If any of you have read 1 John all the way through, it's like a paradox kind of occurs there. It's something like this. Wait, if someone says that they don't sin, they're a liar. But don't sin. Huh? You know what I mean? Like, it kind of gets confusing here. It is addressing blatant, unrepentant sin. It is identifying with the sin and not in Christ. You follow me? We are all going to mess up. But not blatantly and unrepentantly if we love Jesus. If we love God, we'll automatically tend to love our brother. We're going to mess up here and there. It's a guarantee. But we'll be compelled overall to love. 
One who does not love and does not identify with the love of God is someone who will abuse God's grace because the love of God is not in him or her. They'll say things like this, talk about the false teachings. I'm covered. I'm saved. I can do whatever I want. Jesus didn't die so you could do whatever you want. He didn't die so that we could sin. This is called greasy grace or hyper grace. Someone who says that because our sins are forgiven, hey, we're permitted to do whatever we want. It's all good. It's a false teaching. It's like fast food. Not good for you. Someone who claims this is like that abusive spouse. Their motives and their thinking are wrong because they don't have the love of God or his spirit in him or her. This is a person who has a heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that are swift to run toward evil is along the lines of the concept by which we judge crimes in our society, if you want to think of it that way, right? If something is premeditated, it's worse, right? So you have a different kind of standard for crimes of passion. Oops, you know what I mean? Okay, you know, they look at what the record of the person is, no previous history, just an accident. But if someone has a long history of doing the same thing over and over and over again, right? And they thought about it, they planned it out, they wrote it down, carefully executed the crime, it's worse. So that's a way to frame it in your mind. Someone who is truly saved and filled with the Spirit of God doesn't want to sin. When their attention is drawn to it by a fellow Christian or the Holy Spirit, they go, man, oh, I got to apologize. I, I, I got to stop doing that. And yeah, maybe you'll do it again, but I got to stop. You'll feel that conviction come over you. These are the people that come into my office with the four-letter word. Help. I know. When they come to me and they say, help me, yes. Okay, I'll help you. They want to build in accountability. They don't want to do it anymore. We will mess up, but we will mess up less and less as we draw closer to God. I'm not talking about being perfect. I'm talking about having the heart of Christ. A spirit-filled Christian should be walking toward maturity. There should be evidence of the Holy Spirit's presence by that person's actions. We're called to walk in the truth, Walk in light and walk in love as ambassadors for Christ in this world to the glory of God the Father. So here's where we're going to kind of close this idea in an action step. Through bad deeds, bad things, we can become bad witnesses for Jesus without even knowing it. Like the examples I gave before, right? Right? I bet all those Christians in the hotel room didn't know that they were being watched. But they were. So I want to give you guys just one little action step, one little example. I've been challenging myself with this. I can't. <laughs> I've been challenged over the last couple of weeks with this, and I hope I'm passing the test. So those of you who know me know that I love to go get pizza after church if I'm allowed. It's so good. <laughs> Palumbo's Pizzeria. It's like the best in the area on Pine Ridge Road. I'm going to give them props. They're so good. The pizza is so good there. Can't stop talking about it. I could give a sermon on the pizza. You guys would probably like that better, actually. And then we could all go out and eat pizza. <laughs> it's really good pizza. When you come from New York, you really, it's hard to find good pizza <laughs> here. So when you find it, it's like the best thing. Got to make fun of you, Phil. Except Phil. Phil goes gluten-free. Just the whole thing's ruined. I had to do it just because we talked about not making fun of you. I couldn't go a whole sermon without doing it. Anyway, so I go to the pizza place. I got sidetracked there, thinking about delicious pizza. I sit down, and inevitably, I see a Christian family. How do I know that they're Christian? Because <laughs> nobody gets dressed up like that to go to the pizza place at 11 a.m right? Or 1130. It makes no sense, right? Like, hey, let's get some pizza. Hold on, dear. Let me get my tie on in a white shirt. You know what I mean? Like, no. <laughs> and the kids all dressed up, right? Like, so this is the end of their journey. They're finishing. This is the descent. They're just going to blow it, 
right? So everybody knows they're Christians. Everybody knows. Maybe they pray before the meal. No, they don't do that. So they know them by how they get dressed up. So imagine this. You eat the meal, and they leave a really bad tip. I've talked to more than one waiter or waitress that has said they hate waiting on Christians. They hate it. How sad is that? Why? Well, they know the rules, right? They know the Christian rules. They know they should be able to go up to us and go right in the face, and we go, all right, this one too. You know what I mean? They know the basic teachings of Jesus. They know it. They know we're supposed to be extremely generous. They know the story about the guy came up to Jesus and I'm doing everything great. And he said, okay, sell everything. Give to the poor. They know, they know all this stuff. And so when they see us not being generous, even if they messed up, and trust me, in their mind, they didn't mess up at all. So they think they did a great job. And then we leave them a garbage tip. Not good. Now, here's the thing. This may not be you. This may not be your thing. You may be sitting there thinking, Gene, what is he talking about? Stop, shut up. I leave at least 5% when I go out and eat, (laughs) right? Maybe this isn't your thing. Okay. But maybe there are other things you could change right? That make us bad witnesses. And that's all I'm saying this morning. I'm not saying, okay, everyone, be perfect, you know. No, I'm saying just like think about what you do. Think about the fact that people might know you're a Christian or stop trying to hide it so that you can do something wrong. So maybe it's your language. Maybe you got to stop using so many bad words, you know? Seriously, that doesn't make us a good witness, does it? Kind of makes you look stupid. The Bible says, don't use that kind of language. So don't use that kind of language. You know, maybe you just need to be more polite. I don't know. Hold the door open or something like that. You know, just little things. My point is we can do better for Jesus. I think so. I think we can do a whole lot better for Jesus, especially in our community. I've been talking a lot about that. How I just want to be a church that radiates the love of Jesus out there. And that's how people want to come here right? That's our marketing plan. That was Jesus's marketing plan. And people come to me, oh, we got to do this. We got to advertise. No, we just have to go and love our neighbors in this radical way that Jesus called us to love our neighbors in. We want to blow their minds. Like, why did he just do that for me? It makes no sense. Let me tell you why. Let me introduce you to a group of people who get it. That would be cool. Call me crazy. So there's the action step. Let's be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Amen? He puts no conditions on love. None. Find it for no conditions on love. Love, except if they do a bad job. No. Let's win people over with the love of Jesus. Let's walk the walk this week. Amen? Love you.